This is the Hybrid Calisthenics Podcast. Hello, everyone. It is your brother Hampton from Hybrid Calisthenics. I'm sitting here with yoga teacher extraordinaire, Sarah Beth Yoga. She's someone that I saw on YouTube first. I checked out her Instagram content. She just seems like a, a very nice person. And that's really the thing I kind of look for, much more so than fame or notoriety through the podcast is, can, will this person vibe with my audience? And will they vibe with me? Like, can I sit down? Is this someone I would sit down and have coffee with? You know, and that applies to almost anyone, but she just seemed like a nice person. I was like, you know what? This is someone I would be friends with. This is someone that I think my audience would enjoy. And the reason I got a yoga teacher here is because I get asked about things like yoga. And, you know, part of the downside of how my brand has grown is people kind of assume I'm an expert in everything, even though I, I say all the time I'm not. And yeah, calisthenics borrows from yoga. Calisthenics borrows from gymnastics. But I'm not a yoga teacher. My aunt is. Interesting, interesting, uh, fun fact. Uh, but I'm not a yoga teacher. I'm also not a gymnast. So I want to get in and both people I vibe with, but also experts in their field or people who know what they're talking about, do this for a living. And I want to get those friendly, professional, knowledgeable individuals in front of everyone, hopefully expand their platform. And that's what, kind of why I want to talk with Sarah today. We talked a little bit beforehand. She's a very friendly person. I'm going to give her the floor here for a couple of minutes. Why don't you introduce yourself and talk about yoga and your brand and your spin on yoga? Thank you, Hampton. Thank you for having me. And hello to um, your entire audience, everyone watching I'm thrilled to be here and I'm thrilled to be talking to you today because I saw you as you were up and coming and then just exploded. And the cool thing to me was that I was like, wow, there was such a gap in the fitness market and you filled it. And that gap was having this like authentic, friendly, warm and welcoming vibe to say, hey, let's do this, but let's progress to it. Not just check out what I can do. And you know, it, it, it was like the first time that I'd seen something like that in a long time. So I was really happy to see you scale the way that you have in the last year. Thank you. And I'm happy to talk to the people that like you too, because I think that we can share a lot with yoga and calisthenics and how the two can work together and how people can get started in yoga if they're interested. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's a great point is, is, so I mentioned to Sarah before the conversation and the recording started that we actually have a fair amount of Indian people um, in our community. Now, before I get too much into it, is yoga from India? Yoga has roots in uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. And you could say yoga is from India. We can thank our Indians for what we have today and what we're practicing today. Absolutely. And I was having a, a discussion with some people in our Discord yesterday and they mentioned that the western world you know as much as we have romanticized and popularized yoga only knows about a small facet of yoga can you give me some more information on that as to why that is and what part is romanticized and what part is not as well known to the public oh yeah absolutely i mean they're totally correct when they say that what we're seeing today in yoga is just one piece of the total of what is yoga. So what we know of yoga is the yoga sutras of Patanjali were brought to us in the 20th century and brought to the West in the 20th century. And those yoga sutras talked about yoga philosophy, which is the eight limbs of yoga. Asana, the physical posture. So like mm -hmm. asana is, you could say, relates or directly translates to posture or to sit in. That's just one eighth of what yoga is. But that's the piece that everyone clings on to, and that's the piece that's the easiest to market. And so even you're going to find that there's a lot of really, really good teachers out there that present the asana because it's kind of one of those, give them what they want, so then you can give them what they need. And then <laughs> through the asana, you can teach them um, breath work, breath control, you can teach them meditation, you can teach them the yamas and the niyamas. All the full eight limbs of yoga, they include like this, it was a guide that was brought to us by the swamis and the yoga, yoga gurus. And this guide included the yamas, which are the moral restraints. The yamas are like non-harming, truthfulness, non-stealing, moderation, non-hoarding. The niyamas are obs like observances. So like cleanliness, contentment, 
self-discipline, self-study, and surrender to a higher power. These yamas and niyamas are like a way of, of living. But, but let me be clear that yoga is not a religion. So that I think can get really confusing. It's like, but you just said that, you know, there's these almost 10 commandments in yoga right, philosophy, right. right? Very right. similar, right? Yes, because there is roots all the way down into Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism. Right. It's this yoga philosophy that turned me onto yoga so much more than just the 60 minute power yoga class that I took when I was 16 years old. So those, those yamas, the, the moral restraints and the niyamas, the observances, those are two rungs of that eight limbs of yoga, which you could consider to be like, even like a, a wheel instead of a ladder that you climb. There's the physical postures, there's the breath control, there's the sense withdrawal, concentration, meditation, and samadhi, which is union. And it's not so much like a, a ladder that you climb and that you work on one piece at a time. It's all a practice and it's all a, a way of life. But everything I just said right there is so, it can feel really overwhelming mm -hmm. and like you're drinking out of a fire hose. Like it's, it's a lot <laughs> to start with, right? Right, right. So, so having something like, here's a 10 minute beginner morning yoga stretch is a, a nice little trickle like oh okay I'll, I'll try that and then and you start feeling good and you start being more aware of your body i mean there's there's benefits that you start to pick up whether it's physical benefits like increased mobility flexibility strength improved posture improved digestion but then there's the non-physical benefits like increased mindfulness right increased body awareness stress reduction improved self-esteem patience, compassion, gratitude, understanding, all of these things that you might not realize that you're also benefiting like from yoga. So that's why a lot of people, they, they start with this physical practice and then they're slowly given these other pieces. And then some people take it further and they want to go and get a deeper training to understand more about it. They want to read books and it's really what you make of it at the end of the day. And it's totally okay if you want it to be your morning practice. It's totally okay if you want it to be your, it's just the way that I cool down after my workout. Like that's right. okay, like no judgment, but there's so much depth there that you're welcome to explore as much as you want. And if you want it, right? Yeah, if you want it for sure. Like, and that's what I tell, tell people who do Sarah Yoga as well. Like this is your practice. If you wanna go further, totally. I might not be the, the person that can take you there, but I can point you in the right direction. <laughs> but, but, you know, if you want it to be this 10 minute morning practice, and then you want to dabble in a little bit of meditation, you want to learn a little bit about breath work, like all that's mm -hmm. cool. If you just want to stretch after your workout, that's cool too. Great. Great. Is there a progression to that? A natural one that's hinted at or mentioned in, I don't know if there's like yoga scriptures or anything, yoga doctrine where it's, uh, you're supposed to start with posture and then breath work and then meditation, or is it supposed to pick and choose? It's funny that you mentioned the word progression, mm -hmm. because I feel like in calisthenics that like the right. mindset is progression, you know, right. yeah. and in yoga, there's, there's not so much a mindset of progression as it is a, it's such a personal practice. And usually, I mean, it's usually not taught through a screen, <laughs> okay. you know, it's, it's usually right. taught a uh, teacher to student. And when it, when it got brought to the West, it was like teacher and many students and then mm -hmm. yoga teacher trainings. And then, you know, with corporate and people in gyms and, and none, I don't believe any of that is wrong. I believe all of it is a way to, to continue to give people a way to explore this beautiful practice true but when it comes to i mean like it, it's almost like it's been so diluted <laughs> though that it it turns into a personal practice of start where you are and and if where you are is you find yourself at a gym you know at a class that your sister drug you to <laughs> and you know like that's where you are start there right if you're if you've been doing guided meditations growing up because you had a hard time sleeping, maybe that's where you started and just start right. where you are and then allow yourself to go with the flow of your own intuition and what feels good for you. Right. And I mean, I like that a lot. And just touching upon how 
yoga may it's not a religion but you know it has similarities with religion like in, in which there are ways you rec- you're recommended to behave in life and the things you're, you aspire to i think people forget how controversial the tv was you know that that's the thing before smartphones and, and like how controversial tv was i think at the time i'm not catholic but my fiance is and she's mentioned that EWTN, which is the Catholic network, was controversial at the time. I think some religious authorities thought they were against it because I I don't want to speak for them, but I, I think it was like putting yourself on TV was making yourself an idol. You know, people are mm. worshiping you because you're on the screen. Now, you know, televangelists, you know, and I mean, it would be hard to spread a religion if you weren't on some kind of screen somewhere. <laughs> if you were only in books, you'd probably still exist, but a lot of people wouldn't know who you were. So I think Mother Angelica, I believe, was the one who said, no, we're going to do EWTN, and she popularized that. And that's one of the one of the reasons why Catholicism is still as dominant as it is. One of the reasons, you know, there's different things. Now, I, wanted, I had a question as you were going through that, and I just wanted to bring it up, even though it was a little bit while back. You mentioned yoga is not a religion. So just to clarify, can anyone of any religion do it? If you, can you be Christian yes. and do yoga? Can you be Buddhist and do yoga? Can you be Muslim and do yoga? Or is there a particular religion where they seem to not be compatible? So my answer is yes. I believe that you can use yoga to deepen your faith and to deeply connect to your faith. Other people would disagree. Mm-hmm. And that's that's okay. I'm not going to argue, mm-hmm. especially because that's your own belief. And if your own belief is that you cannot practice yoga and have a faith of a specific kind, like that's your belief and that's fine. I'm not going to push it on you. But I can tell you that I, I've grown up with experience with a lot of different religions. I grew up with a Muslim family. I grew up with the Catholic family. I grew up with a pagan oh. family. I grew up in a Jewish community. How'd that happen? Um, How did you go through so many things? I, it's just divorced homes and lots of experiences and having parents that were extremely open to me exploring and trusting that I would eventually find my own way. So I never was pushed in any way, but there was also no fear of me. My friend wanted to take me to Baptist camp. I was like, sure, let's go. Right. You know, and and I was just very open to all of it because I, I had learned very young my, my stepmom, one of the coolest people I know, she brought me to a, like a spiritualist church mm-hmm. and, and he taught me something that I continue to teach people today. So this isn't mine. This is something I learned a long time ago, but it's the white sheet concept. So imagine that between you and this source of light, like a light bulb or something is this big white sheet mm-hmm. and that white sheet has a bunch of holes in it mm-hmm. and you walk up to the sheet and you put your eye up to one of the holes and you go, oh my God, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Hampton, Hampton, come here. This is, look at that light bulb. I have never seen a light bulb so beautiful. I have to share this with you. Come look at this light bulb. Right. So you walk up and you look at a different hole and you go, oh my gosh, that diamond is radiating. It is gorgeous. Look at that amazing wow no it's there come here no it's not a light bulb come here the diamond look it and then every right, other right. people come up you know, we're all looking in my mind and in, in how i was raised we're all looking at the same thing and it's breathtaking and it's amazing and it can change your life but it's just interpreted a little bit differently no matter mm-hmm. like your how you're looking at it or what hole in the sheet you're looking through but if you step back you can start to see this gorgeous it's all the same and and i really feel like yoga can embody that too in the sense that we're all connected we're all one and so when it comes to religion that that's how i was raised and that's how i continue to look at it and that's Mm -hmm. i'm very welcoming with people and religion and we have people that practice yoga and use scripture as part of their intention while they practice or they'll do you know faith study in the morning And right after, use that as the intention while they're practicing because yoga can be very meditative. Right. Um, Instead of thinking about everything you're going to do during the day, you can just let your, either let your mind just rest Mm -hmm. in in that meditative state and coming back to your breath, or you can rest on your intention if you do that one. 
Okay. You said you explored all these different religions. Is there one you eventually settled on? No, no. Okay. I would not call myself a religious person. Okay. As cliche as it sounds, like I, right. I do consider myself very spiritual mm -hmm. and I have my own understanding of spirituality, but it, I think it was the, the fact that I was able to explore so much. And I mean, the library I had growing up in my home had a lot of different religious texts um, and right. books in it. And I think that allowed me to explore it, to see it, to appreciate it and to respect it in my friends and my peers and continue to find my own way. It was right. when I found yoga philosophy that I was like, oh, this is really in line with, with how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, not Like I said, yoga is not a religion, but the yoga philosophy and the eight limbs of yoga was the first time that I felt like something is in writing that is closest to how I feel and what I believe. Okay. Yeah. So I grew up in the Bible Belt. I'm in Arkansas. North Arkansas, actually. So yes, I, I'm familiar with the idea of a lot of people trying to introduce you to religion. And for me, that actually kind of drove, I was open-minded to it, but the way it was presented is almost stereotypical in that there was a lot of fire and brimstone and fear used to try to coerce me. Fear, maybe from a place of love to where they wanted me, you know, they wanted to save me, but there, there used a lot of fear. And eventually I was kind of driven away from it. But eventually after the I was never afraid, but after I was away from that, I didn't have that influence. I kind of found my own way and connected with my own spirituality and my own religion. And there are some people that I've noticed, and I, I don't mean to condemn them. They, they might be right, but like just how dogmatic their religion is to where you have to do this. You have to be this sub-denomination of Christianity in order to go to heaven. And I always tell them, I was like, well, you understand you're, you're going to be like, if you're right, you'll be going to heaven with like 20 people, right? And then it's like, then they say, yeah, I'm like, okay, well, you have fun. You enjoy. Uh, I mean, they might be right. They might be right. But that's something I heavily agree with. It's like, whatever, however, what I, I want to identify as, you know, I feel like I could stretch it in many different ways, but like gratitude, kindness, giving to others, you know, gratitude is a big one. Accountability too. But I mean, gratitude, just being able to see life as a gift. You know, these are all things that I want to connect with spiritually before I associate them with religion, right? Mm -hmm. Because, we'll, I mean, whether or not people realize, we see this religion through different lenses. And again, it's we're in different holes. We're looking at the sa same thing. We think they're different things. But even in the same hole, uh, people are like, well, I think it's it's like eggshell white. And, it's like, and they're like, no, 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 you're wrong. It's pastel white. I don't know if that's a thing. You know, but I think it's pastel white. And so the, the, we love to argue about it. But ultimately, what are the things that connect, connect us? What unites us? Okay, because if your religion tells you to be a horrible person and to steal and hurt others, then I, I, even if you're right, I don't want to be that. Even mm -hmm. if you're right, I, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be that way. So absolutely, I, I just want to um, echo that, that if it is, again, I'm not a yoga teacher, but these values to embody... I think they can work with any good religion in the sense that, you know, patience, kindness, gratitude. I know, I know these aren't all yoga things, but these things that I'm thinking of and associating with them, I think they can, they can benefit people because one of the videos I'm going to make soon is fitness doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? Your health doesn't exist in a vacuum. Like some people love that I talk about mental health and different things. Others are like, why, like I follow you for pushups. Why don't you just talk about pushups? And, you know, and I, and I get that, you know, and I, I respect that. And I try to keep that in mind, but, you know, nobody that I know of can maintain the same fitness and health, no matter what's going on in their life. Okay. Like if you, if you go to the gym, you go bankrupt, you're not going to go, you'll be able to go to the gym because you probably have to work up other issues. So if your finances even affect that. Or if you're, if you are like this buff, strong dude, but you're depressed and you, you I mean, you don't want to live life anymore. You know, I, you know, you, you might, it's going to affect your motivation. So your fitness doesn't exist in a, in a, in a vacuum. And I think that's why introducing these things, like your life, your mindset, your lifestyle, and how your, your perspective on how you approach life is, is as essential as learning to do proper form on, you know, wheel pose or push-ups and so on and so forth. Well, there's that classic saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. Right. You know, right. it's, it's totally holistic. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So you mentioned that a lot of people are introduced to yoga through these postures. If you could, to the people watching this now, because if they made it this far, they're usually in it for the long haul. You know, like some people watched a couple of minutes like, eh, this isn't for me. So people who watch this far, they're usually in it for a long haul. That's why I kind of waited. How would you recommend they start? You mentioned that you have like a seven day intro course or something that you, I think you mentioned was free to get people started. Is that where you would start them from? Or would you tell them, hey, read this article first? Yeah, I, I'd say start with uh, the seven day beginner yoga challenge. Uh, the reason I would say to start with that is because, like I said, it's it's easiest to consume starting with those physical postures, starting with a 10 minute yoga video that it feels good, you know, so okay. that you're feeling rewarded while you're doing it. And after you're doing it, you're getting that reward feeling of like, wow, my muscles feel good and I'm not as stressed and not as tense. I'm definitely going to do it again tomorrow, you know? Right. And during those 10 minutes, I'm just dripping out little pieces of information about what yoga is and what you can recognize in the posture and what it means in your body. Because in what I teach is that yoga is an outfit that looks different on every body. So it's going to look and feel different for you than it does for even me on screen. I do my best with modification screens to show you the variations, uh, the progressions that you might, you might think of it as. Mm -hmm. But I, I really encourage people to listen to their bodies and to be aware of their own bodies. And for a lot of people, that's one of the first times that they're doing that, to be aware of where their leg is in space if they're not even looking at it. And so you, you'll you gain a lot just by practicing these videos and trust that, that the rest will come over time. So I would recommend starting with something like that. I mean, that for me, I created this beginner yoga challenge because... People like the word yoga challenge, you know, right. they like to, they like to think that they're going to challenge themselves to do yoga every day for 10 minutes a day. And I like that too. I think that's a great way to start to build the habit. So mm -hmm. I created these 10 minute beginner yoga videos, but I started with the idea in mind first, if I'm going to create 10 minute beginner yoga videos for each day of the week, what will I do knowing that on Monday, people are going to want to just stretch out and feel good, but by Saturday, they're going to feel a little bit energized. They want to maybe get some blood flowing. And by Sunday, they're going to want to just like chill and get some <laughs> deep stretches. Because a lot of times the yoga for beginner keyword on YouTube, the things that you're being served is because of SEO and keywords and people's ability to, you know, to work with the algorithm to make sure that you get this video. But sometimes it's not the right video. So mm -hmm. a lot of times yoga for beginners, that keyword is such a hot keyword. It can be placed on videos that not rest, not really necessarily for beginners. Right. So I wanted to make this, this seven day challenge, these seven, 10 minute beginner yoga videos to actually truly be for the absolute beginner. I mean, I'm sitting on, on props. I, and the props I brought on screen were like, here are two pillows. <laughs> I'm going to use two pillows and instead of blocks, because not everyone has yoga blocks, here are two thick books, or you could use, you know, two acrylic cups for blocks instead. Like mm -hmm. I tried to bring in these items that are just like household items, a robe belt instead of a, a strap so that anyone could walk in and they don't have anything to do this, but they can just turn on the video and, and trust. I got you. Okay. So. Yeah, I would, I would definitely say to start there. People who are, who are more into it and definitely they're like, I've, I've done yoga before. I like it. I think it's cool. <laughs> what, what next? Like, I want to know more. There is a book I recommend. I might even have it on my okay. shelf somewhere. Yeah. Hold on. It's right here. This book, this is yoga and the path of the urban mystic by Darren Main. Okay. You can see like all of my little. <laughs> right. Okay. So this is something that you've studied and you've marked. Yes. You like yes. it a lot. So for any of the people here that, that have, you know, they're like, yeah, got it. I've been through that. I, I want to drink out of the fire hose. I want to know more. That's, that's the next place I'd say to go. Cause that's a great book to study, to learn more about the yoga philosophy. And I liked it cause it was yoga in the path of the urban mystic. It's really, you know, it's like there's this mysticism side to yoga, but we live a modern life. How can we blend the two? And that's mm -hmm. what I try to do on my channel. And that's how I try to explain the teachings of yoga is in a way that you can apply to a modern life. 
Right. Okay. And just to give anyone, you know, that extra little boost of, you know, do I want to try this? I probably will try it. You know, when after we're done and you link me, I'll link it in the description. I'll try your 10 day yoga challenge or uh, seven day yoga challenge. And, you know, you know, I thought I'm always happy to learn, always happy to learn. And, you know, I, I, you know, it's not how I would expect us to start it, but I'm almost glad we started talking about religion and how it can affect yoga or how it's, it's relationship with yoga, because some people will be scared. And I mean, before anyone laughs at them, you know, it's how they were raised or like the people they were in. It's like, Hey, you want to avoid this, this yoga and other stuff. I was actually um, involved in a Tai Chi group growing up. And that's something that's very similar. That's what I was reminded of when you were talking about that, where it's not a religion, but it's, it has, you know, so many mental aspects to it that some people think it's a religion or it's associated with religion. And my father was, was a teacher and he taught Tai Chi and we got a, a fairly big fo following even when I was a kid and I started doing it when I was three. And w we became aware kind of from like hearsay that this church was preaching against us. This church like 20 minutes ago was like, you know, and I mean, as an adult, if, if I were my father, I probably would be hurt more by that. But as a kid, I was just like, well, what is that? But they were saying, you know, we were like demon worshipers and so on and so forth. I, there was nothing in that. It, it was, it was really all about health, mental health, physical health. So there is that. So just to convince someone, I'm, I'm willing to try it. I'm willing to try it. I don't think it's inherently demonic. You know, someone who worships demons might be able to do yoga. You know, I'm not ruling that out, but I'm going to try it. And I don't worship demons. So <laughs> that's something. Uh so, so the demon thing, that is a fear-based statement that, that somebody has made. What they're referring to is that the roots of yoga and the yoga postures are mm -hmm. representing different Hindu deities. That's what uh, I figured. Hindu, Hindu gods. Yeah. Yeah. But, but anyone from another religion that might have a lot of fear around them would look at anyone other than their own God as a demon. So that's, that's where that comes from. In case anyone's mm -hmm. like, what are you talking about demons? You know, you know that's exactly okay. what that comes from. Yeah, I didn't from. mean to scare anyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's like, that's exactly what it is, is that anyone who is looking at it and it's like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Like, you know, Hanumanasana or like, like, what are you saluting the sun for? Like, what is that? Like, there's, there's a lot of fear there mm -hmm. within certain groups. And, you know, that's, like I said, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to try to sell right. it or convince anybody. <laughs> but if, if you're interested, definitely give it a try. Because it, it can be something that can be life-changing and transformative. Right, right. And I, I like, again, just to give people an encouragement. Some people might unfollow me for this, in which case, you know, I'm sorry it offended you. I I'm willing to try it. You know, I I'm, tr I'm trying it. I've done like yoga, like posh calisthenics steals. I'm just going to say it. We steal from <laughs> other disciplines. You know, like, that's what it is. You know, like we took the, the, the wheel pose and we made it in, into the bridge. You know, like, I, I mean, I know other things do that, but I mean, almost all our exercises and things like even the handstand, you know, who knows who, where we took that from. There's gymnastics, yoga, so on and so forth. So I, I've done it before, but I'm willing to delve more into it. I'm willing to delve more into it. And this is what I would say to the people that are still concerned about, you know, like if you are really bored and bred into this religion and you think any other deity from another re religion is demonic, how I would see it is God has given us the ability to move our body through through space in these ways. Um, and just because another religion or another practice has used it for something, like imagine if actual demon worshipers, you know, like they, they put their hands together like this, doesn't mean that anybody who does that is worshiping a, a demon. I mean, and why did they get it? Well, why did they get sold dominion <laughs> over that pot? Like they never copyrighted it. What if, what if I want this to mean I, I want a medium sized pizza? You know, like, well, why, why, why do they get the definition of it? So God is giving you the ability to move this. And I think it's really about the intent. Okay. If you're waving your hand, you're smiling and you're, and you're thinking bad thoughts, you know, that's probably more evil than someone going through these postures um, and trying to think good thoughts. That's my opinion. And I'm sure if you disagree, people 
are very happy to tell me when they disagree. So that, that's those are my thoughts <laughs> you, on it. You have a big enough audience for that. Right, right. Well, you know, and that, that's good. You know, I, I try to listen to people and I try to respond to them respectfully. To give the kind of pivot a little bit, let's talk about yoga for athletes. So mm. like we talked about yoga for, for beginners. Let's talk about people who are already somewhat athletic or are somewhat athletic and they want yoga to enhance the performance. Two things I, I want to touch upon is my friend showed me this app she was doing yoga from a little while ago and i forget what it was called it was like yoga fit or something like that and their tagline was you're only as old as your spine or you're only as young mm -hmm. as your spine does the yoga and that was something that kind of surprised me because it's something I, I i've talked about but i didn't realize was a big aspect of yoga is caring for the spine a big part of yoga i the spine is part of the body Right. And, and caring for your body is a big part of yoga. It, it really depends on the teacher and the roots of their knowledge and their teaching. I, I have a background in as a chiropractic assistant and yeah. functional movement. So I, in, I like inject functional movement into my teachings and into the, the poses and I borrow little pieces from here and there. Right. Right. So yeah, I mean, your your spine is is essential, but it's also not like this one piece that we're going to take out and focus on. I've heard that that quote before too, and and that's that's a great quote because once you stop, once you like lose mobility, not just in your spine and your hips and your shoulders, in your body, mm -hmm. um, that's when when aging starts to really, you know, starts to go downhill. But you can reverse that by by practicing to increase the mobility in your body, get more synovial fluid along that spine right. and in your joints. And so th there's definitely like a huge benefit in your physical body, which is again, why the postures and the physical practice and the routines, why those are so popular. And if I were to make a yoga video, like 10 minute morning yoga for beginners, a physical routine, mm -hmm. and I was going to make a yoga philosophy video or a breath work video, Mm -hmm. And I put them both on YouTube at the same time, or, you know, they, the same variables, right, that, right. that physical posture video would just skyrocket. And this right. one would just hide in the background. But if right. I injected some of that breath work into this one, mm -hmm. you know, that's where I'm like, I'll give you what you want. <laughs> and then I'll also give you what you need. <laughs> yeah. Without even knowing. So yeah, th that, th that makes a lot of sense. Th that makes a lot of sense because when I heard that I've, I have some friends who are chiropractors and of course, like they're all about the spine. And I've talked with, I've done a podcast with a chiropractor before a couple of them, and they talk about the importance of the spine. How does yoga go hand in hand with chiropractic treatment? Cause you worked as a chiropractic assistant before. Can it go hand in hand? Does it do anything to align the spine? And is there anything in particular you can do for that? Uh, so I wouldn't make any medical claims. Of course, uh, definitely of course. far out of my expertise, but I would say that definitely that yoga can be very supplementary to a, you know, spine health routine mm -hmm. or regimen. When it comes to chiropractic, we found me and the chiropractor I was working for, and we had a CrossFit instructor in our team as well. And we all worked together and we found that, that all of it can work in such a way that, I mean, the, I was teaching yoga up the wall, <laughs> like where you lie on your back and you put your legs up a wall and there's right, different right. kinds of positions. So it's like a variation of yoga. Mm -hmm. I was teaching that to heavy weight bodybuilders, like uh, okay. these, these champs that, that had a really hard time getting into those positions, but they, they saw the benefit, you know, the, the benefit of, of being able to do a squat up the wall was allowing this, this I mean, he, he's like world-class. It was allowing him to be able to have a better and deeper squat right. uh, just in general, because he was training his body to do the, some, the same thing, but with a shift in gravity and reducing the amount of strain that was getting put on his joints. Mm -hmm. He blacked out again, by the way. Right, right. For our video watchers, as Sarah notes at this moment, my camera did in fact black out. So it overheated and I turned it on later in the interview and it, everything was okay for the rest of the interview, but I'll put a picture of me for the people who are watching this for now. Okay, so back from that short break where I was fixing 
my, my visuals. I'll put a little picture of me on there. It's clear that yoga and just mobility work in general can help athletes, can help bodybuilders. And again, these are things that arguably, you know, for a lot of things, if not all of them, that your body should be able to do. Can we bend backwards? Can we move our head backwards? Can we twist? One of the things that I like are twist holds. I don't know if there's special, there's probably a special word for them in yoga, but I like twist holds. And when I mentioned that they help my back pain and my neck pain a lot, tremendously, I got a couple of emails, a couple of messages, and they said, well, no, 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 twisting is bad for your body. It's bad for your spine. L listen to this person. And, and I, I listen to those people and what I'm saying in twisting doesn't, it doesn't contradict that because keep in mind, a lot of things represent things we should be able to do, right? Like when people say like sit-ups are bad for your back. Well, I mean, waist flexion is part of natural movement. Or you should be able to flex your waist, right? Now, you know, like the reason why people say that sometimes you may have some medical issue, you may have some like tightness here, or you may not be ready for it. You know, like I, I'm 150, I fluctuate between 150, 160 pounds, not a very big guy, but if I were like 350 pounds, it's going to put a lot more pressure on my spine <laughs> when I do that. So there's certainly some things you shouldn't do, but mo learning to do yoga has clearly shown a marked increase and performance for a lot of athletes. And you can certainly do your own research on that. Cer certainly something that I, I would strongly stand behind. And one of the most famous things and a lot of people were introduced to yoga this way, especially athletes and just high performance athletes was uh, DDP yoga. I'm sure you're familiar mm -hmm. with that, right? And for those who are unfamiliar with it's Diamond Dallas Page. He was a former professional wrestler who ended up injuring himself. And he had a lot of he had issues. <laughs> he had issues. The st his stuff wasn't working the way it was supposed to work. And he started pursuing yoga and he was able to do things that he never thought he was able to do again. Can you kind of delve into your knowledge and your experience as to how that works? Like why is yoga sometimes so healing and so restorative? And again, we're not making medical claims, but I mean, you can read th these cases of people who have benefited from yoga, who have lost weight from yoga, who have just like, Injuries they thought they couldn't heal with, they managed to greatly progress with in yoga. How is that the case as far as you know? Well, yoga is definitely something that, that high performance athletes use as part of their regimen. And, and it's something that can benefit everybody from, you know, the mom next door to the NBA star. And the reason for that is because yoga let's just talk about the physical side first. It's going to improve your mobility. It's going to improve your range of motion. I mean, you're working your range of motion. And a lot of it is with just straight body weight, just like calisthenics. But there's a fluidity involved in yoga that is allowing you to move your body in a way that you probably have not moved it in a long time, mm -hmm. which is why people tend to come back to the practice. It's because they're like, yeah, I not only am I stretching, and not only am I holding these, these postures and challenging myself and building muscle, but I'm also increasing just straight up mobility. I mean, it makes your life easier, whether you're trying to carry, you know, all the grocery bags in in one trip, or you're trying to carry a big heavy load of uh, laundry or garbage, you know, like, or you're trying to carry kids on your hip, or you're trying to just not be in pain every day. Or you're trying to not wake up with tension and you want to reduce your headaches. Yoga can help with all of those things. But on the, on the more mindfulness side of it, yoga also teaches you, like I had mentioned, body awareness and mindfulness. And you can learn through yoga breathing techniques to calm yourself down in the moment. So an example would be like if I'm in traffic and I'm already late, you know, and, and I can feel that tension building up in my chest and it's like, and, and I'm, but I need to focus on the road and I, I just, I'm struggling and I'm feeling very unyogic at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I will remember techniques and tools that I've learned along the way. And that would include like relaxing my gaze. So I'm not sitting there like, you know, all frustrated in my face. Like, okay, it starts with the muscles I can control and relaxing those, deepening my breath, being mindful of my breath. So I'm using these things as a way to tell my body it's okay. 
You can be calm. What am I in control of right now? I may not be in control of the traffic, so I'm not going to stress out about that. But I am in control of my breath. I'm in control of the muscles that I tense up in my body. So I'm going to do my best to relax those. And like an NBA player might use it in such a way that he's at that free throw line and and he's sweating and his heart is pumping and he can hear everyone around him and he's so you know distracted and yoga or a piece of yoga has taught him this mindfulness to okay take a deep breath focus run through the motion like you've been through that motion a million times before do it in your brain do it in the body right and and be able to tune all that out and and i think that Yes, there's that physical benefit of yoga, and that's how a lot of people are, are gaining from it. A lot of athletes are gaining from that physical benefit. There's that, that mental benefit. And then there's just the aspect of rest. A lot of people are so go, go, go. And a lot of athletes, they're working out training hours and hours a day. And, and they're doing you know the, the instructed protocol of recovery as well. But yoga is giving a structure to rest and recovery and, and allowing yourself to go into the yin side. Yes. And when we need that, we need that balance. And if you don't, if you don't give yourself that balance, you're, you're going to get it. <laughs> Your body right, is right. going to find a way One to way get it. One way or the other, it. yeah. Yeah, it's gonna, yeah so, so this is a way that it's, it's actually structured that you can do that. I created a yoga for athletes collection a couple of the videos are on YouTube. Oh, um, good, good. I'll link that below. Remind me. Yeah, yeah. And and for people that don't know me, all of my collections, I wear a different hi, hi. a different outfit for every collection. So if you like oh, something, okay. if you see that outfit again, it's that exact same collection, just a different video from that same collection using the same theme, some of the similar postures, the same music. So I like I'll create eight videos for one collection. So I have that's, this athlete. That's such collection. a good idea. I, I should do that. <laughs> I just put the same shirt. <laughs> well, then you gotta buy all the same shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I gotta I, yeah, I gotta buy <laughs> some some of the greatest have that. <laughs> right. I, I think that's a good idea. So yoga for athletes, uh definitely check it out. That's something I will also check out. And I think that's a good segue into some someone I want to talk about, someone who's become very famous. Uh, you know, Wim Hof. Yes. Yes, he was formerly a yoga instructor. Uh, he's been on a Joe Rogan podcast. And interestingly enough, you know, as you mentioned, you know, people are usually drawn to the posture stuff. Like you think yoga, and then you're like, what do you think? You know, most people think either a logo or they think, I don't know what the most famous one is, down dog, up dog, you know, one of those. Okay, but he actually popularized breath work, you know, among, yeah. among other things. Can you give some... And he talks a lot about his breath work, of course. He has a lot of free content about it. But can you give some insight as a yoga instructor into what he's doing and how it applies to yoga? Oh, I mean, he's he's definitely doing yoga. It's just not what everyone thinks of as yoga because okay. you know, everyone thinks that yoga is that physical practice. But yoga is as much as it's meditation, it's breath work, it's, it's all of it. But like we said at the very beginning, when people think yoga, they think physical postures. And if physical postures aren't there, then what is it? It's all yoga. I don't know. I mean, the breath work that he is producing and providing and marketing, it's it's amazing the way he's doing it. Right. And the people that he is able to reach that otherwise wouldn't have been reached by like me or right. other um, yoga teachers or even gurus or swamis. So it's, it's really cool when people can take aspects, whether or not what he's teaching right now in his words is yoga. That's, mm -hmm. that's up to him. And that's up to the people that are, are practicing right. the breath work, but we've, we've done Wim Hof here. My, my husband did like a whole program with like Wim Hof program and oh, cool. yeah, like the cold showers and like all right, of right, that. Right. And it's, it's just, I love it. I love growing and learning in every way. And I love that people can have that access to more tools and techniques that can help them grow or evolve or just something they can keep in their back pocket. Right. They need it. Right. And I love that too. And the reason I segued from that into professional athletes into this is because there is the aspect of yoga, you know, where it's like you're relaxing, it's gratitude and, and postures but kind of in the back of our, I feel like kind of in the back of the public mind, there's also a connection that people read somewhere or they heard an interview where yoga allows you to do 
what things that were previously thought to be superhuman, right? Like like Wim Hof stings, you know, n- n- nothing crazy, but I mean, like like staying under ice and not letting his core temperature drop, you know, holding his breath for a long time. Even away from Wim Hof, there are some people who I think like walked on fire or something. Can you give some light into that? Is that how that works? And is that part of yoga or is, is some of that just myth? I mean, I don't, I, so I walked on fire at a Tony Robbins event. Uh, it okay. wasn't, <laughs> I, I didn't consider it what we were doing to be yoga, but definitely there are some very similar aspects there. I mean, there was some breath work. There was like, we, we were like chanting like, yes, yes. Or cool moss, cool moss, cool moss. It was like two in the morning and there was like, you know, all of these like hot coals and lines and there were people ready to help you. And you had to get yourself in state to do it. And if you weren't in state, you weren't ready to do it. And you you would have gotten burned. Right. And so they had people at at the front of the, like the hot coal line looking at you to see, are you in state? And if not, they'd turn you around. But like, you're, you're like, you're in state, you're going, you know, yes, yes. And, and you're just like vibing and there's so much like adrenaline and serotonin and just like oxygen in your system from, from doing that kind of just chanting and getting yourself physically and mentally in state that, right. that like we did it. I walked on fire and I was like, did it hurt? Oh no. <laughs> Were you burned at all? No, no. Right. I, and it, I think it, it was like, it was at least, I think it was like 25 feet of, of hot, That's pretty coals, far. like yeah. red hot coals. But like I said, I, I, I wouldn't say that your yoga practice is going to make you magical or mystical and be able to do these un, unrealistic or like inhuman things, but you can get there if you want to, if that's your practice, you can, you can do what Wim Hof is doing. You can learn how to hold your breath for three minutes right. or you can learn how to get yourself in state to do those kinds of things. But that's not really the yoga I teach. And that's, that's mostly like not the yoga that people practice either, but it's for some people, it's a really fun, you know, thing to work your way towards. Right. Right. Well, I mean that, I think as a guy, I'm drawn towards that. <laughs> that's, that's, that well, what is the, uh, cause I mean, this is a common enough thing that I'm sure it's been studied. There's probably some like scientists react to this. Well, what is the, what is the explanation behind why we can do that without burning our feet? Do you know, or do you have a kind of, do you have, you did it. So do yeah, you have like a, yeah. a guess as to why it is? I, I mean, I cannot recite like scientific facts or tell mm-hmm. you or cite like sources, mm-hmm. things like that. My husband is such a sponge for that, that he can mm-hmm. like hold it and then like produce it right when you ask for it. And right, I'm, right, I'm right. the one that's like, yeah, like once I learn something and I use it and it's like, it's gone again, you know? Fair. So I, I, we could probably do some research and right, right. answer that scientifically, but mm-hmm. I'm in no place to answer that scientifically. Well, no. And I mean, the reason why I don't mind talking about that is because I've heard about that before. It's been done before. I like, and you've done it before. I think it's been shown that it, at least some of the time, it's not a trick, you know, it's not, they're not like, it's not yeah. just painted red. It's actually, you, you can actually feel the heat. So, you know, if someone's listening to this and they're wondering, and I'll, I'll look it up afterwards, well, look up like why someone can do that. But like, because surely there's an explanation for it. And I, I'd be curious, I'd be curious. But yeah. you, men- you mentioned that's not the kind of yoga that you teach. What are the types of yoga and what do you teach? Oh, so there are a lot of different styles of yoga out okay. there, especially because there's, there's several different schools of yoga. And so of the many different types of yoga and styles of yoga out there, I actually have a video that does explain this. I teach, I was first trained in power vinyasa yoga. So, and that kind of has a a root with like Baron Baptiste and Johnny Kest. And my first training was through core power yoga, which I think many people would be familiar with in the U.S. Okay. And so that's, that's what I was first trained. And that was what I was first teaching. And then from there, I was receiving additional trainings in yin yoga, hatha yoga. And hatha yoga is kind of this umbrella term in general. So it's confusing when someone says, this is the style of yoga. It's Hatha yoga. It's all Hatha yoga. So okay. that's, that's just something that's going to be confusing from the start and has been even for me. And then I, I've been trained in, in prenatal yoga, several different trainings since then, Ayurveda. But 
what I teach right now and what you can expect to see right now is going to be power yoga, which is a more athletic form of yoga. It's going to okay. build muscle. It's going to build heat, but it's also going to build mobility because you're, you're using these balancing postures and standing static holds and then adding on a little bit of fluidity. It's intense and it's a great style of yoga to use when you're thinking, I really just want to work out. Like I want to, I want to feel like I, I got a good workout in, but I also want to do right. the yoga. I also want to <laughs> feel like I got the stretching in. I also wanted some of that Zen. So I always tell people like, if you, if you want to work out, do the power yoga. Okay. Then there's vinyasa yoga. Vinyasa means flow um, okay. or to place in a special way. And what you're placing in a special way is the, the posture within the flow. So it's very fluid. You're breathing in and out of poses and typically you're flowing one breath, one movement. So Vinyasa yoga can be really intense for someone who's new to yoga and isn't familiar with the poses yet. Mm -hmm. But when you start to become familiar with the poses, and by the way, a lot of people start yoga with that same feeling. Like, I have no idea what's going on. I don't even know if I'm doing this right. And, <laughs> and that's exactly how it's, so many people start. And that's totally okay because you learn as you go and you get more familiar as you continue to practice the poses, you continue to hear the pose names and you start to feel it in your body and you learn how to listen to your body, which is one of the most important pieces in yoga. Mm -hmm. So there's vinyasa yoga, which is flow. Flowing one breath, one movement is something you work up to. And then you, you tend to repeat sequences too. Right, right. After vinyasa yoga, then there's the hatha yoga, which is more of a, just a gentle stretching style of yoga. You're not holding poses for minutes at a time, but you may be holding these more grounded and gentle poses for three breaths or five deep breaths. And there's more of an emphasis on a deep calming breath. Again, like I said, hatha is this umbrella term relating to all physical yoga as well. Mm -hmm. But if you go to a studio and they say, Hatha yoga level one. That's what they mean is that it's, it's just, you're going to be doing more of a stretching, less of a flow and definitely no power poses or isometric holds within okay. this class either. And then there's the yin and restorative and yin and restorative are very, very similar. Yin is without props uh, okay. so where you're holding postures, but they're grounded postures like half pigeon or like a lizard type lunge, like where you're actually more towards the ground instead of trying to hold yourself up against gravity. Even like a basic hamstring stretch where you're sitting on the ground, you're like extended out in front of you, where you're holding those kinds of poses for up to three minutes, maybe even five minutes. Even okay. something like a child's pose held for three minutes can be completely different at the end of those three minutes than it was when you first got into it. Hmm. And restorative is, is, is similar, except I, I treat restorative as the same types of poses, except that you involve props like bolsters, okay. dense yoga cushions. But if you don't have that, you can use pillows off your bed or cushions off your couch. And the purpose of the cushions and the props is to help bring the ground up to you so that you don't, you don't tense up when you're in the pose because it's so much body weight pressing down into that one position. Right. Some poses just feel like too intense, too fast. And if that's happening, then you're going to feel your body tensing up against you defensively. And there's only so much you can do to remind your body to calm down. It's okay. I'm in control. You're safe. Let's work with the breath. Let's work with the muscles we have control of. There's only so much you can do there before it's going to be more beneficial to bring a prop in to say, okay, here, here's a little bit of assistance. Right. And you can actually get deeper into the pose that way. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, so just to summarize for people who are listening, what is the type of yoga that you teach? A mixture of all of those? I teach all four of those styles. All yes. four of those styles. And, and you'll see it if you look at my channel, I have color coding. So pink <clears throat> thumbnails is power. Mm -hmm. Teal thumbnails is uh, vinyasa. Blue thumbnails is hatha. And purple thumbnails is yin restorative. And like when I do calendars, like... I'll, I'll even color code the calendars so you know what's coming. <laughs> You're so organized. You're so, I, I, need, I, need so organized. I need people ask me for stuff like that for my, my stuff. And I'm usually the designer, um, designer, video editor, everything, the camera person for my stuff. So I get behind it. But when I see that, I'm like, oh, that's such a good idea. Color coding, you know, such, such a simple thing that, that I need to do on. So I, I need to do more. And so that inspires me. Thank you. 
Well, you know what though? It, when you can allow yourself to outsource the things that you don't absolutely need to do, you open mm -hmm. up your space for being able to do the things that would um, amplify the artist within you. Mm -hmm. Like this is, a, this is what I usually share with people is the color coding that I have. These I like that a lot. top four are what is on YouTube. And then the bottom two are what I include in the Sarah Yoga app, which is a private membership outside mm -hmm. of YouTube. And so this allows people to really understand what they're looking at and what they can expect. But back in the day, I used to do everything and I hit a wall and I was like, I couldn't even organize my content properly behind mm -hmm. the scenes. I couldn't even tell you what music was in what video because I was so overwhelmed just trying to get the next thing out. But mm -hmm. now I have a team, a producer, a videographer, an editor, right, um, right. and that allows me to, to really focus on those, those kinds of things. Right. Well, and just, and we'll talk about why this is relevant and why we're, why I'm talking about this in just a moment, but that's something that I will expand in, especially towards the later part of this year. And especially in the 2022, because I recognize that I, before I did what I do now, I was into design. You know, I, I did design work, web design, print design. So I, I make no claims that I'm like especially talented at it, but I am very picky. I, I, the, the reason I did it is because I like, I have a very specific vision and this is what I want. And one of the things when people ask me, what do you want for this, this design? You know, like I tell them, I recognize that, hey, you know, I want this kind of color. You know, I, re I realize communication is important, but what I really want to tell them is just blow my mind. You know, I, I, I want something that I look at, I go, whoa, that's amazing. Obviously it's subjective. So it's something that I want to expand in, but what I'm going to do, I think is as I release some creative control, because I don't want, you know, I recognize that I can't do everything, even if I would like to, I'm going to try to give some more guidelines and be patient with people, you know, and recognize that yes, I could spend a hundred hours over the course of a year, teaching them what I want and helping them develop their skills if they're new to this. And then they can just leave me, you know, you know, but you know what we empowered them, you know, and I, and I hope they're happy. And, and that's kind of what I want to touch upon, you know, how much time do we have left? You said, you, you said you had a couple of hours. I just want to respect your time. Yeah. I've got 45 minutes left. Okay. I got 45 minutes. And I want to bring something up because talking to my community, something I've, we've talked a lot about yoga, but talking to my community, what I've realized is as people watch these podcasts, as people watch these videos, or even before I did YouTube or any kind of social media, as I watched videos, as I was the consumer, there was this thought that I didn't realize so many people shared is I want to do this. I'm inspired by this. I want to do something similar. You have like a million and a hefty million of followers on YouTube or several hundred thousand, I think across social media, of course. What if someone wants to do what do you do? What if someone is already a yoga instructor, knows most of the stuff that, you, that you've talked about or similar things, and they want to expand? Can you talk a little bit about your journey as to how you televangelized yoga pretty much? <laughs> yeah. So I used to, my husband actually spent the last year and a half or two years coaching people to do exactly this, okay. uh, especially because of the lockdown. A lot of people, their studio shut down. They weren't able to do what they were good at anymore, which is teaching in person. So they wanted mm -hmm. to turn to online. Right. And so he helped a lot of people go online. He's actually the strategist behind Sarah Beth Yoga. What's his name and real quick? So, so people know. Leland, L-E-L-A-N-D. Okay. So people can find Leland. him if they want his services. Yeah. I mean, they could just email like my, my support email and ask for him. Okay. He's actually uh, shifting from a hard focus on yoga just to consulting in general, because he's worked with like sneaker aficionados and pro <laughs> pro bowlers and right right you know and real estate guys and it, for him <clears throat> it's really fun when he can go and like explore these other realms as well but point is is that if if you can teach to a room of people you can teach online and the thing that stops people a lot of times is well there's a couple of things one of them would be the awkwardness of looking into a camera and teaching at nothing and talking right. to nothing. And then sometimes people just get stuck looking at themselves and then they start to pick apart themselves and they're like, oh, I don't look good on camera today. I'm not gonna do this, you know? But it's <laughs> like, no, no one's gonna get on this YouTube video and click on it and be like, oh, she looks good. I'm gonna watch this because I just wanna look at her face all day. I mean, maybe there's a couple of people that are like that, but <laughs> right, people right. Are going to, <laughs> they're gonna continue watching and they're gonna stick around because of how you made them feel and right. because of how they relate to you. So mm -hmm. when you're authentic and you're real and you're raw and you're relatable, they, you're going to find people that are 
looking for that, you know, so you don't have to be this like perfect representation of what you think you need to be. I mean, I'm a yoga teacher and, and I like getting my nails done, you know, right. and I, I like wearing like athletic clothes and I like to look nice on camera, especially cause I, I shoot in front of a million lights on a white backdrop. So I have to wear HD makeup. So I don't right, look right. like a zombie on screen, you know, <laughs> but, but anyone could look at that. And I've had people comment saying like, Oh, you wear makeup. Oh, so not yoga. And it's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> is, is that <laughs> how you read it in your mind? When you read that comment? It's like, so <laughs> <laughs> right so much stats but it's just funny to me because it's like isn't like judging others not yoga like right. this is me this is my practice this is what I'm sharing and if it's not working for you that's fine because there's other amazing humans also sharing the same thing and their version of it but when I'm talking to the camera the thing that really helps me and that I think helps a lot of people that I, I really try to share is to imagine when you're talking to a camera that you're talking to a room full of maybe just one person. Like for me, there was a person named Jen who was following me early on and I turned her into my muse. I was like, all right, Jen, you know, uh, young thirties, mother, two kids, mm -hmm. um, likes to do like tone it up fitness. Right, um, right. She's getting into my yoga videos. She started with the power videos. This is what she, so, okay. I'm going to imagine right now that I'm talking to Jen and all of a sudden I would just animate. Cause it was like, I'm making this video for Jen. I'm talking to Jen. And then I would add more people to my little room. Great idea. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So, That's the, that, you know, it's so, it, so we did We talked a little bit before this podcast, but I didn't mention this part, but yeah, that's what, that's what I do. Like the way I make my content and the way I, I do, do business at all, everything that, the public knows about me as Hampton from Hybrid Calisthenics. I do in that way. The reason it's hello, my friend, is because I make it as if I'm making for a friend that I know in real life that I'll see in the grocery store. And that's who I'm making. I like, I'm talking, it's like, if, am I teaching a friend push-ups? Am I teaching a friend this? And that's also the reason why I can't sell any scammy stuff because these people know me. So <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, like if I scam someone on the internet and there's going to be someone in real life that I know that bought it, and he's going to tell my dad. He's gonna be like, yeah, hey, Hampton's <laughs> he's gonna call me, like, hey, well, why are you doing this? So yeah, absolutely, great point. I think when you talk to the camera, talk as if you're talking to a person. Yeah, and it helps if you can actually make a real person, like, like take mm -hmm. somebody who's been engaging with your content and engage with them, you know, on the camera. And the thing is, is when you start talking, like when I'm talking to Jen, mm -hmm. other Jens in the world are listening, and they're like, oh, is she talking to me? I have to go find <laughs> my friend. Go find my friend, 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 come here. Look at, she's like, she's talking to us. And then right. more and more people start to relate because, because it's, it's relatable. It's authentic. It's real, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that is a, a huge reason to, to your like success is your authenticity. People can see right through the camera and they feel like they just seeing you. They're not seeing this fake persona. You're not trying to trick them. You're just, it's like, it's as if you just turned on the camera and started talking to a friend. Right. Right, but and that I think that relates on this side as well. If people wanted to go online and do what I do, it's the same thing. But people get stuck in one being being too hard on themselves, judging themselves too harshly, right. and, and and not knowing how to talk to the camera. Which I had a background in modeling and PSAs and runway work, and so I I, I knew how to be in front of a camera. Oh, really? Okay, a huge benefit. Interesting. For yeah, modeling and runway work. Yeah, well, and, and PSA is learning how to read scripts, memorize them, talk at the same time, and walk, and and have this whole, you know. <laughs> so that that was a big benefit for me, and and learning that side of even hair and makeup and cameras and lights and all of that too. But you don't need all that, and and people don't need to be to have like a production studio that they rent out. They can record themselves in their own home, and that's how I started, and that's right. how I gained my success. As people were like, oh, she's just like me. She was doing yoga in front of her kitchen. Oh, her cat walked through or, oh, her, her husband just had to go to work. Like it's right. so relatable. People love that, by um, the way, the things that we, we think are outtakes, people love yeah. that. You right. know, whenever right. I'm like, oh, it's like, I, like, there's been like a hair in my face the entire time. Well, sorry. You know, the, the information doesn't change. The yoga yeah. posture you're teaching doesn't change because there's a smudge on your face. <laughs> so right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the other thing I think that people really struggle with is um, imposter syndrome, which right that's not going to go away. You know, you can be a million subscribers deep and you can still experience imposter syndrome. It's just right. something that you learn to recognize and you learn to, to contain like, Oh, okay. Like 
I still go through that. Who am I to have a platform this big and to talk to people about this? Like, I'm not, I'm not like the yoga expert. I don't want people to look at me like that. And then I remind myself, I'm no, I'm not the yoga expert and I'm not pretending to be, and I'm not going to fake myself out to think that I am, but I am going to share my experiences and through my experiences and my practice and the teachings that I build around, you know, things that inspire me, like if it's quotes from a book that I think relate, or if it's pieces of yoga philosophy, people, they eat that up because they want to learn it. And, and they might want to learn it from many people, or they might just want to learn it from you because like you're real to them and you relate to them and they, they understand all that, like everything we just talked about. So it's not about, it's not about being the expert and the person, just it's about being you. And you can't right. be an imposter version of yourself. Exactly. Right. The only, I say this all the time when people ask me what I'm doing. I say, well, I'm just trying to be Hampton. Best in the world at being Hampton, this Hampton. You know, there's, there's other Hamptons out there. They're really good, but I'm this one. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a great point. And I want to touch upon something. When you're talking about, when you're talking about you know, you don't, when you're, you're under HD camera, you're under a lot of lights, you, like, especially if you're doing it in 4K, which I recently did a video in 4K, people can see every detail. Like, oh, oh, it was oh. hot outside, <laughs> and, like, I could see the beads of sweat on my forehead, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but it, I still post it anyway. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I'm, I'm still saying the same. Don't look at me while I'm talking. It's like, this is a video where you, just don't, <laughs> where you don't look. Do you think, and I already kind of suspect the answer to this, do you think there is a higher expectation for females to look perfect on camera? That's an interesting question. I, I mean, I think that maybe there's a high expectation in life. Right. Do you feel, um, pressure, but that's do you not, feel pressure from it? Mm, I was just about to say that, that I don't think that's only for females, though. I think men also right. have a, a, a different set of expectations. And I think that having the internet, and especially lately in the last several years, what has happened to social media with Instagram being this like, it just has to be the perfect picture and the right. perfect lifestyle and the perfect. And now everyone's using filters and, you know, and it's becoming this, like, everyone's looking at everyone else being like, can we just have some real finally, like everyone's looking the same and, and there's face tune for video now. And, right. you know, it's, it's getting ridiculous, but even before all that was a thing, it was still like, you know, magazines had cover models and, and cover models would, right, would work right. out all year long and then and cut so that they could be that image for that one shot. But then after that shot, they went and lived their life and they don't look like that anymore. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. Like, it's, I think that's always been around. Okay. And I think for me, I, I don't think that it's been a negative pressure for me. Okay. Um, I think it's been a positive influence because it gives me a reason to take care of myself more than mm -hmm. like, it gives me more motivation. Right. To, something to you choose out. to do, something you choose to do as opposed to being forced to do in your opinion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if I was forced to do it. I enjoy makeup. I enjoy being on camera and, and, and thinking about like, how can I wear my hair for this one and my makeup and the outfits and, and like how all that coordinates. Cause that's the artist part of me. Right. It's okay. going to be thinking about all that and I enjoy it, but I hired a personal trainer last year. I would, I don't think I would have ever done that if I wasn't a public persona, you know, Interesting. and, and to me, it was like, it was a benefit of the fact that I have the means that I can do that now. And mm -hmm. that I, you know, so I, I love it. I, it's a fun place to be. I feel very fortunate that I have an additional motivation at the same time. I have fluctuated like 40 pounds in my career twice, getting pregnant and then postpartum getting pregnant. Right. And, then postpartum. and I, that was a really great process for me to go through publicly because I had talked about it a lot on Instagram at the time. And it's an Instagram stories under postpartum where I talked okay. about that kind of, this body is very different than the body that I knew prior and right. learning to love that body or accept that body, or even just recognize that this is what the body looks like after it has a baby, right. you know, it, and, and this, cause it, I remember the first time I saw it was Emily Sky Fitness. She posted a story of what her stomach looked like a month after having a baby. And I was like, finally, thank you. Because all I ever see is like the bounce back. And right. it gave me, it. that is what gave me these unrealistic expectations was hmm. people who 
who were represented and, and there are a very very small percentage of women who can bounce back like that their body type is just maybe built in such a way or their core is built in such a way that 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 is realistic to them but it's not realistic to most women and that was the time when i struggled but i did it publicly and i showed up on camera with extra weight because i was like i'm not going to just like hide for it's, it's real it's real right. uh, that's yeah right real. unfortunately my content is evergreen so any video you click on you wouldn't know where i am in my journey you just be like, <laughs> why was she super thin in this video that was 10 years ago and why right. is she you know <laughs> well you, when you have a when you have a kid you tend to you put on some weight and then as you get old yeah so like people change absolutely yeah and it's one thing that i mentioned just for people watching you never really know if a video is going to blow up so you know if you're sitting on your bed make your bed uh <laughs> because it, it could be seen by the entire internet you never know so yeah. do keep that like don't have overly high expectations of yourselves be real but i mean you can make your bed you can make your, you can do that and the reason i asked that point is because we do have a lot of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs aspiring content creators in our in our community and i mentioned to you that our demographic actually fluctuates up and down in terms of gender i guess where there's been times where we were very male dominated, where it was mostly guys watching me. It really depends on which video recently trended. And then I think right now on Instagram, we are female dominant. I think two to one, two to one on, on Instagram. So there's a lot of uh, aspiring content creators. And one of the things they ask is they feel like, th the question I ask, they feel like there's more repression on them to look perfect. It's like, see, and like a good example would be, I don't have to put on makeup before I, <laughs> before I, I, I do a video. And I think in their minds, it's more okay to the world if I look imperfect as opposed to them looking imperfect as a woman. What would you say to them? I would say that a lot of that is going to be perceived external expectations mm -hmm. perceived. So how okay. do you think that people are perceiving you? And, and it's totally fair to say that you feel that pressure. Right. That's fair. But I think that authenticity comes through the most. I know right. people that, that don't put on any makeup or that, you know, they, they, they're not as concerned about the aesthetic side of it and it doesn't matter to them. And they just want their message to go out there. And, and yes, there is a benefit in having a nice aesthetic to deliver the message, but sometimes it, it's really the, like we said before, the authenticity, sometimes it's really just the way that you make people feel. And right. if it's not, if, if you're a woman and you don't wear mascara and you don't like mascara and you don't want to put on mascara, then don't put on the mascara. You know, there, you There's a, there is a benefit to learning how to use lighting to your advantage. Right. You know, bad lighting is going to make anyone look rough. And lighting is be hard really to... important. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and it's hard. It's going to be hard to receive a message from somebody whose lighting is making, you know, showing all of these shadows and all the wrong places. Right. There. You know, so there's a benefit to learning all of those pieces, even understanding, like for me, I use my shelves as my backdrop and that like, I do it every time that I am on camera with a, like a vlog or a live or like an interview. Mm -hmm. And that way it, it gives a little bit of personality and then allows some consistency. And then when I record my yoga videos, I'm on this white void. There's like nothing there, but me. And I did that on purpose so that it could be a focus solely on like the contrast of my body against that void. So it's almost like, like the, this magazine, like image of yoga mm -hmm. so that it's, it's really just like, what does the pose look like? And there's no other, there's no other distraction there. So like right. you can create your brand and you can make it look beautiful in your own way, but the farther you get from who you truly are the worse you're going to feel when you build an audience around it. So continue Amen. being yourself, right? Amen. Continue being yourself in everything that you do. And you might not know who that is because I mean, teenagers, right. you're still figuring out who you are. Mm -hmm. Young twenties, you're still figuring out who you are. So you might be figuring it out as you're going online. And like my voice in my first few videos, I'm like, oh, cringe, <laughs> you know, or, or like the vibe, you know, cause it's like, Hey everybody, welcome. Like, right. But that's not me, but that's okay because no matter what you do, you need to be okay with being a beginner. You need to be okay with like, oh, like cringing at it, knowing that you're going to get better every time. Same thing goes for yoga. Right. The practice, 
will allow you to get better. And as you get better in producing your content online, you can continue to inject yourself into it. And then when you build an audience around who that person is, you can be assured knowing that those people like me for me, not for who I'm pretending to be. Right, right. And especially if you're going, so we talked again a little bit before this about how volume is important if you want to communicate to a lot of people. And like all the stuff you're going to have to do, if you're going to do this for the long haul, you're not here to like be here for six months, make a million dollars and leave. If you're here for the long haul, the real sustainable way to do that is to be yourself because you're not always going to be able to manufacture that character all the time, especially on, I think about every live you do. If you're huge and you're like the biggest YouTuber on the planet, the interviews you do on CNN, interviews you do on MSNBC, are you going to be able to manufacture that character all the time? The answer really is no, in my opinion, it's no. And it's going to be so exhausting. And you're going to have a mental breakdown. You're going to have yeah, a mental yeah. breakdown. And the benefit to those people who said, oh my gosh, I'm going to have so many mistakes doing this. The benefit of that is where there's everyone thinks it's it's tough because you have to start from zero. It's actually a benefit because not that many people are watching. Okay, when you make a mistake, five people saw that. You can delete the video later if you want. Okay, if you if you were given five million followers and you have to make your first video, <laughs> um, then yes. lots of people see that mistake, and then those people they might see the mistake and might they might unfollow you. But well, we're done. You know, so people who are given a huge following at the beginning, sometimes it's kind of like winning the lottery, right? It doesn't work that great and doesn't work that great um and th that's that leads me into this point that i want to talk about because i know some people are thinking this i try to communicate with a lot of people i know they're thinking this we talked about the expectations we have to be authentic but we, to try to be perfect but it's better to be authentic some people are watching this and they think Ugh, well, that's easy for you to say you're a, you're a runway model you're, you're gorgeous you know like, like people who think this like or you're thin I'm not any of those things. People who think that Ma male, female, or whatever gender, you know, they're, they're looking at us and they're thinking, well, it's easy to say that when you're privileged, when you have this privilege of being what society might perceive as attractive. What would you say to those people? Do, do you think that attractiveness is a key factor in whether or not you're successful in this kind of field? I definitely believe that there is such a thing as a pretty privilege. And I think that that is something that has been a, an advantage or a benefit to my channel's growth. Absolutely. Okay. When I entered yoga teacher training, I was shifting in a place in my mind where I thought all I had going for me was my looks. I didn't think wow. I had anything else. Yeah, I, I had a pretty low self-esteem. I didn't think that I was smart by any means. I loved, <laughs> I loved math. I mean, I, I really I enjoyed calculus. And, but that was like this nerdy side of me that I was just like, at least I'm pretty. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I thought that's all I had going for me. And there was a, there was a time in modeling that that's, that's what I used to, to build mm -hmm. a career. Right. And then I, I felt so empty and okay. I, I really did not like the the life I was living, waking up at, at weird hours to drive to shop in BC, to do my own makeup, to be on camera, to like model some fancy ass, like, you know, watch and right. like, you know, or, and I've done, I've done really awesome photo shoots too, like with Lifetime Fitness and with Kevin Love and like with Target, but it just turned into this thing that I was like, man, like I'm not in control of my life. I'm not in happy? control of what I'm producing. I think I've always been happy. <laughs> okay, cool, good. Yeah, I've I've learned how to I learned I learned how to have happiness and how to how to be happy and grateful even when I had nothing. That's uh, awesome. And so that is something I did have. But when I first entered yoga teacher training, I I really had a very low self esteem, and it's funny because you know going on camera that was my first thought was that people are going to realize I know nothing or what if I am as dumb as I think I am or because I had such a low self-esteem at the time. Right. Right. So yes, I, I think that there is such a thing as a pretty privilege, but I don't think that somebody who doesn't consider themselves beautiful, which by the way, everyone is beautiful. Bodies are beautiful. Amen. People are beautiful. Yeah. Right. Right. There is a, and, and, and with that being said, there's also this kind of like crimped up version of, pretty right right you know and aesthetically pleasing and right traditional um, like traditionally accepted as beautiful i guess 
Yeah, and there's also trends in fact. Right, and, exactly. You know, and 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 we can get into body positivity because like body types all had their time. And, it's so and fast. all continue to have their time again, right? So fast. Even since I was a kid, we're, like you and I aren't really even that old, but like we think about the size of butts has already changed. <laughs> like the preference has changed so much. When I was a kid, it was, I think you wanted small butts and then it was big butts. And then it, it was like curvy butts. And then it's going up. People used to cry if you told them they had a big butt. Okay, now yeah. if you don't tell them that, they're crying. <laughs> okay, yeah. that happened within 15 years. That's not a whole yeah. lot. So these people who are hurting themselves to conform to a norm, guys or girls or whoever, by the time you conform to that, it might have changed or it might have changed again. So just keep that in mind. It's your body. You can do whatever you want. But keep in mind that the norm you're trying to, con to conform to, it might change by the time you're done with that. That norm, by the way, that trendy norm is a part of this marketing that is used to sell you something it's used to tell you that there's something wrong with you something broken mm -hmm. that oh my gosh look at this this product right here only five payments of 9.95 plus shipping and handling will fix will fix right. that problem for you really so it's like we spend too much time looking at screens and comparing ourselves and our bodies and our aesthetic to something else that's different from us right and and that can be this trap that makes you think that you're not pretty enough or you're not good enough or you're not smart enough or you're not fit enough or you're not flexible enough or you're not you know blank enough whatever right. that is um, absolutely absolutely and i think i don't know like it's it's going to be hard to convince people about this depending on the person who i'm talking to because you know again we're talking to a large amount of people if it was one person i would frame my statement a little bit differently but what, like every, in every way that I'm disadvantaged, whatever ways those might, those might be like financially or however, you know, I want to prove to people, there's part of a chip on my shoulder. I want to prove that we can win. You know, I, I not, because I, I know it's not like my own ego, but people like me, I want to prove that we can win. One of the things I tell people, because they're, you know, I'm just putting this out there because some people may not, they, they like all the things you said about attractiveness and pretty privilege and everything. This is what I'll say, you know, Sarah Beth, was a runway model. Hampton from Hypercalisthenics was never a runway model. Okay, I don't think I could have. I, I could have been a model. I, I think I think I have what's called what I would call a reverse halo effect, where people think I'm better looking than I am, because I'm nice to them, <laughs> because I, I'm kind to them. But if you actually look, look look at some old photos of me, like definitely not like the ones who are not touched up, the ones that's like old Facebook profile pictures. I consider myself a pretty average looking person, but people. And I, and I recorded with a front camera on my phone, okay? And people, st I still connected as people, okay? And you look at the original comments from when I first started trending, okay, none of that was, this is just if you think I'm attractive. Some people might be like, Hampton, I think you're the ugliest person in the world. You, you're just, you're friendly. I watch you because of that. That's fine. I, I, I respect your opinion. <laughs> but, but people would think, no, 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 you, you have to be attractive because there are people who think this. And when I'm talking to the uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, you have to be attractive to be successful I don't think that's true because once again, everyone is beautiful and being able to recognize people as beautiful, seeing people and the potential they have as beautiful is a tremendous impact on your life. You know, being able to see other people for the beauty and the potential they have is going to improve your life so much. And it's also highly subjective. You know, there's someone out there who finds you beautiful the way you are right now. Well, so the thing is, is if you were trying to promote yourself on a platform that is purely aesthetic, then maybe that's the problem. Maybe you're trying right. to put yourself on Instagram where everyone <laughs> is like, like tweaked and, and, you know, pinched and snatched to the nines. Right. Right. You know, and that's just, that's not the right place to be, I think in any place of mental health, but the beauty of YouTube and the beauty of the internet and the way that it's mm -hmm. evolving is that you're putting more than just your physical appearance out there. And, right. and I can tell you, I can tell everyone here has experienced this. A beautiful person with an ugly heart is no longer a beautiful person. You no longer look at them like, wow, like they're radiating, they're glowing. You're like, oh, like that's, that was really awful. And, and it's just a different light is now cast on that person. Right. And the same thing happens, like you see it on the internet too, is that you could look at somebody who may not consider themselves as aesthetically pleasing or snatched or whatever, you know? Right, right. But but they they have a beautiful heart and they have a beautiful mind and they have a beautiful right. way of explaining it. And, and right. all of that beauty shines through. And one of my favorite quotes um, that I continue to carry with me is like, how you look is the most, is the least interesting thing about you. <laughs> right. 
right? Right. So, so don't get caught up on that 2D image. Get, mm -hmm. get caught up on your message. And, right. and again, like if you're talking to the gens of the world, the gens of the world will come and listen to you. But if you're talking to the mean girls, maybe you're talking to the wrong crowd. Right. Right. And then, you know, I'm going to take a different, like, I know we're nearing the end of it, but I really do want to touch upon this because you mentioned something that I think resonated with some people. Because while, again, we're talking to a room, some people are thinking, oh, well, I can never do anything because in their opinion, they're not attractive. But some people, I think what you said also resonated with some people where they think all they have is their looks. And that's, that, that's a bigger trap than a bigger mental trap that I think some people realize because it's been popularized partially because of jealousy, maybe not entirely popularized the hate on the so-called Instagram models or, you know, especially with like the OnlyFans thing that's going around, even not adult stuff, but just even people who want to sell their looks. You know, it's easy to hate these people because it's like, they're doing so well. How come they're successful? Whereas I'm way smarter than they are. I'm way more deserving than they are. And I'm making a fraction of what they're making. You know, I, I'm, I'm not refuting that necessarily, but I would try to have some compassion for those people, you know, because I mean, I, I'm not going to speak for all of them, but I know some of them are thinking or have realized at some point that what they have is their looks and their opinion. You know, they could have so much more, you know, you know, Barbie, the OnlyFans model could also be Barbie, the engineer, you know, or, or Barbie, but, the but motivational the speaker. Time. Yeah, yeah, but at the same time, if, if Barbie, the OnlyFans model is enjoying her career as an OnlyFans right. model, you know, like Enjoy if that. she's happy within her, you know, her definition of success and she is living to her highest values, then she is successful. Right. And so are you. It's apples and oranges because everyone, like the way I view success is living among your highest values and that's going to look different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so when you take something like, you know, comparing what you're doing here to what this other person's doing there, and, and being like upset about it, you can't compare those things. Right, right. You know? And, and Go on. the feeling that you, all you have going for you is your looks, that comes from a, a background of trauma. I talk about this on, on my Instagram uh, quite often. Every Valentine's Day, there's a post that I put out to talk about domestic abuse. But that, that was something that stemmed from trauma. And, and, you know, quite a few men and women have experienced similar kinds of trauma, whether it's sexual trauma or domestic um, abuse that, that they get to this place where they don't, they don't even love themselves anymore. They don't know how to pick themselves up. They don't know how to heal or, or become their own self. And so that's, that's kind of that place that I, I kind of blossomed out of. Right. And I hope that I really hope to reach those people with my yoga and the impact. That right. I can make there you go. Lives. You know? There you go. Yeah, that's like the uh, the macro message that you have. Like the, the, there's the postures and the breath work and everything. But after you have people's attention, what do you want to tell them? And that's one of the messages you want to deliver. And I think that's very powerful. And I think I would, you know, again, once again, to content creators, entrepreneurs, you know, you, what kind of message do you want to deliver? I've interviewed some strongmen before, and one of the reasons for them doing what they do, like old time strongmen, is they did feats of strength, and then when they had people's attention, they they delivered a motivational message. And so I, I do research on everyone I do a podcast with, because I mean, like I wanted to do a, a yoga one, but I was like, well, who should I do? And I, I remember you commented on one of my posts. I was like, oh, I, I think she has good vibes, but I wanted to do some research just so we, like we, we wouldn't end up arguing. Because uh, I mean, who knows? Some people might be like very, very opinionated and aggressive. And I was like, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to do that on, on the podcast. Especially with the uh, yoga teacher. Right, right. I just, well, I mean, that might be interesting. It's like, it's like I interviewed the most aggressive yoga teacher in the world. But no, I, I looked on your website and one of the key things, I'm like, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to reach out and talk with her. Is it says together we can change the world. And it says a portion of each membership is being donated to Operation Underground Railroad to fund the rescue and recover of children and vulnerable adults who are a victim of human sex trafficking. And I know some people don't like hearing that. They, on, they only want to hear about the good in, in, in the world, mm -hmm. but that's what made me want. That's one of the key things. Maybe it's like, you know what? I, I want to connect with her. Can you tell everyone a little bit about more, more about that yeah. and how, what your connection with it? Yeah. Yeah. So I always knew I wanted to have a bigger impact on the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I first started my business, <clears throat> it was merely survival, just trying to, just trying to take care of me. And then once I was able to build the business to a point where I was taken care of, then I wanted to take care of my family. Once I built it to a point that I take care of my family, I wanted to take care of 
my community and then it slowly grow bigger and bigger and it got to a point where I was like I want to impact the world what can I do and so I just kind of put that out there that was my intention there's no answer yet but it'll come to me and it right. did come to me I was at a business mastery event in Florida and I learned about human sex trafficking and I learned about Operation Underground Railroad and there are a couple other organizations that I'm communicating with right now that are also fighting human sex trafficking because I want to just broaden that reach I left that event. My husband and I went to the event together and my husband was like, you know, he was like in business mode, like, yes, yeah, like we got all these tools and techniques. And <laughs> right, right. I left the event like furious. My blood was boiling and it took me days to be able to process because I was so upset about what I had learned about human sex trafficking. I was like, mm -hmm. I was living my life just la di da. And I had no idea this was going around. This is going yeah. on in the background. And I've got kids. I have, my boys are three and five now, but at the time when I learned about this, they were, I think, like zero and two. <laughs> right, right. And, and I was just, I mean, I, I, I saw, I'm so thankful and grateful and fortunate for, for where I was raised and where I was born and the privilege that I've had in order to get to where I am today and that other people might not have those privileges and they might have been, been victimized in this way and that there's people that are, are being just stolen their lives are being stolen from them and it infuriated me and i was like i've got to do something i can't i can't give myself like i i, I want you know I, I could go undercover and i could you know i could <laughs> right like i was like i could i could get in there and, but i'm like no but i'm a mother like i i need to right. be smart and safe about this so it felt right to me to align my business and a portion of the proceeds of my business to help fight the fight because not only do the organizations that I'm partnering with, with the rescue operations, but they equally help with the recovery operations. Okay. So people who get rescued, they need it. They need regular therapy, regular right. counseling. They need to, to learn skills in order to be able to build something for themselves again, because they were just taught that all that they're valuable is this one thing and that they know nothing else and they're not gonna be able to live a life on their own. And so this recovery team will provide them with education and skills and knowledge and consulting in order for them to go and become a seamstress or open a business or become part of the community. Right. And, and to me, that was really important and essential. And so being able to align my business with that, it gave me a new drive. Because at the end of the day, it wasn't just me anymore. I'm like, I'm right. taken care of. I'm good. What else can we do? Exactly. Greater purpose, you know, greater yeah. purpose. You know, I think yeah. I, I've been thinking about that a lot because I've been thinking about different businesses I want to do. And something, something I want to tell people is like, I, I'm covered right now. Everything else I want to do. And I, I recognize that that's a blessing in itself. Not everyone gets to do what they love as much as I do for a living, but I'm covered right now. I don't have to sell coffee. I don't have to do this. So if I'm going to do it, it might as well be done well in a way that I like, right? I mean, and that's kind of like a, it, it's a thing that I think not everyone is comfortable with, where if you give someone the impact where they can make an Instagram story and make $20,000 from it, like it's like from a 15 second video, if they, if they link it the right way, they, they don't know what to do with that power. But mm -hmm. I, again, you know, there's some responsibility that comes with that. What do you want to do? And do you want to do it well? So I absolutely salute your story for that. It's something I'm going to look into. And I do, my apparel company, Beautiful Day Apparel, is supposed to, I'm still building it, but it's it's going to fund causes I care about. And I, that's something I, I want to look into is, is yours. Right now it's St. Jude's, because I mean, we got a lot of different recommendations and there's a lot of different causes I want to I want to support. But that's definitely, like when you ever see me writing and I'm looking away, I'm not not paying attention. I, I'm writing down I notes. Know. Okay. I, I, I <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for telling me about that. I really do appreciate it. Just to quickly finish a thought that I was, I was making a little while ago, because uh, I don't want anyone to misinterpret it, about Barbie, the, the OnlyFans model, and Barbie the engineer. Yeah, power. look, if, if that's what you want to do, power to you. I think we should be all so focused on improving ourselves, we shouldn't be thinking too much about how other people supposedly can improve you know, to our terms. But if you, if, they are, if you are bummed out about it, if you are kind of like Sarah, Sarah was a, a little while ago, where she's like, well, all I have is my looks, you don't know that. You know, and it's probably not true. There's so much you can develop, so much you can explore. And just to finish the point I had before that is it's very easy to hate people we perceive as successful. You know, like we think like well, this person sells a picture of their face, you know, and they get $10,000 where I like, I, I work for an entire year for that. That person might be depressed. They, they might think in their opinion, 
that they have to shake their butt to get in, to get money. And that's like, if they think that's the only thing to do. So, I mean, I guess like reduce the amount of judgment we have for other people. It was my yeah, point for that. Yeah. Yeah, have some compassion for other people. You don't know their full story. But at the same time, have some compassion for yourself because they could be happy and they could be successful. And it has nothing to do with you. There is no relation and there is no comparison. Mm -hmm. And turn turn your awareness inward and, you know, learn to love yourself and know that even if you feel like there's nothing you can give, there's always something. There's always, you can always give your heart. You can always give your mind. You can always learn skills and let people follow you along as you, you know, explore passions. Okay. For sure. Right, right, right. Well, and as we um, absolutely agree, and as we wrap this up, look, I was telling Sarah, do you go by Sarah Beth or is it Sarah? What do you do? So Sarah Beth is like the yoga. Okay, <laughs> so okay. Yeah, so Sarah Beth is my name, but my family calls me Sarah. Okay, I was going to say Sarah. Sorry, I should have asked that at the very beginning. To- um, no, that's totally fine. <laughs> business, business wise, Sarah Beth works for Sarah. Okay. If that if that makes sense, so like that way I can separate and I can have some containment in my life, so I'm not right, like, right. blending this like business world with my family world, and it allows me to create containment in my life. Right on. Right. On. Well, so I mentioned to Sarah before the podcast. I'm. I think 100%. And I was going to say almost, but no, 100%. I'm friends with everyone I've done a podcast with. So, you know, and I want to try to give to my friends, you know, like there's there's like a give mode and a take mode. And I usually try to be in give mode. So, you know, I like your message. I like what you're doing. What do you think I can do to help you in your, in your journey, not only as a content creator, but as in what do you want in life? I want to look into Operation Underground Railroad and other causes. And like, there might be at some point where we can collaborate. Um, and do something like that. But what else can yeah. I do? What else can I give? You know, I think um, just like companionship and having camaraderie and and being right. able to communicate with each other behind the scenes. I think that that's really massive. We were talking about it before, just the mm-hmm. ability to be able to email each other and be like, hey, have you ever worked with this company before? Right. Like they don't expect that we're talking to each other. But right. the fact that, because I, me and, and the other like big yoga teachers, we all do this. We're all friends behind the scenes and we all like hold each other up. And just knowing that there's no competition here. No. Success is an abundant resource. It's a collaboration. So let's all help each other. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is awesome. I'm so happy to be here to talk to you and to build this, this friendship with you um, awesome. and your audience and Anyone in your audience that is interested in yoga, I would definitely recommend to check out the seven day beginner yoga challenge for we'll link below. <laughs> beginner yoga videos for each day of the week. And there is one question I saw that was asked a few times in the post mm-hmm. you put on your tab. And that question was people asking about how do I marry my yoga practice and my calisthenics practice? Uh, and I want to answer that real quick. And you should probably put timestamps on this video. Yes, I will. I will be like, I watched an hour and 49 minutes just to get to this point. (laughs) But (laughs) for for trying to have a calisthenics practice and a yoga practice at the same time, there's a couple of ways you can do it. One, you can use yoga as your cool down. So you can use calisthenics to build yourself up, to get your blood flowing, to feel great. And then you can use your yoga practice as your way to kind of stretch it out and cool it down and, and get some fluidity and mobility into your muscles and joints. So that's, that's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to have yoga on your off days. So right. calisthenics, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, yoga, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, maybe Sunday. But when people think of yoga, I think that a lot of people assume that it has to be 60 minutes, like all or nothing. If I don't get right. my hour long class in, then ugh, like not even worth it. And that's not true whatsoever. I always say that even five minutes of yoga a day is better for you than one hour once a week. Okay. Small amounts of yoga more frequently is going to benefit you way more than a lot of yoga all at once. So that's why I like this 10 minute, you know, yoga video a day for the beginning right, challenge, right. because then you can do your calisthenics and you can have little pieces of yoga in between. It's, you're going to feel good. You're going to benefit. You're going to get those physical benefits we talked about. You're going to get those me- mental and mind, mindful and emotional benefits that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And you're going to build a habit, most importantly, of self-care, whether right. it's meditation or yoga or calisthenics. So that's what I would recommend when people are trying to think, they're like, what do I do and how do I do it? And if you're really being technical about it, if your calisthenics practice was full body, look for a full body yoga practice after that. If your calisthenics practice was lower body, 
look for a lower body stretching practice after that. You know, same thing, upper body, upper body, match those kinds of things so that you're treating your body with this love and respect as you go. Beautiful. I like that a lot. So final stretch, red carpet. Anything you're working on? Anything you want to promote? Anything you any, well, put your social handles down here, but anything you want to drive people towards? What should they check out beyond the things we already mentioned? I, you know, I would just love for people to check out that beginner yoga challenge that we mentioned that's, that's linked below. My YouTube channel, I upload to that once a month, recently, twice a month. I'm adding to the app about eight videos every month and a whole new calendar, like a, a month-long daily yoga calendar, almost every single month that we follow together as a community. So if you really want to get into it and you want to find like a yoga family, a community, I recommend joining us there in the Sarah Beth Yoga app. You can also go to my website to get more information about that or to join us there. Right now, what I'm working on is a chair yoga collection. I have so much yoga out there. I've got like 600 what? yoga videos. Okay. At what point is that enough? Never. <laughs> so I more. To start more. Creating... <laughs> yes. Right. Right. At one point, I just, I want to start creating this kind of complete journey and I'm seeing gaps. And one of the gaps would be chair yoga. I've got people that are like, I would love for my mom to be able to do yoga with me, but you know, it should really benefit from doing chair yoga. So okay. there's a lot of reasons why chair yoga would be beneficial for a lot of people like desk workers, seniors, total beginners, people with low mobility, or just somebody that wants to feel good, but not use as much of their energy to do so. Right. Um, so I'm building out this chair yoga routine and, and a whole collection of routines like chair yoga for headaches, for your lower body, for posture. And I'm going to put a couple of the videos on YouTube as well. We're going to put some eye strain stuff in there. So one of my mm -hmm. members asked for some eye strain yoga. I was mm -hmm. like, brilliant, because people who sit at chairs and computers all day tend to have a lot of eye strain. And right. so we'll use a couple of techniques to help reduce eye strain at the end of that practice. And you can expect to see that come out in a few months. I actually record like two or three times a year in batches. Okay. So when I'm talking about something, it, you're going to see it months later. Wow. Yeah. But what's coming out in like what you're going to see next would be probably my collection, which is half power, half yin videos. So the first half of the video is power. Second half of the video is yin. So like mm -hmm. the yang is what's going to warm you up and the yin is what's going to cool you down at the end. Okay. So they'll see that. And then stretchness is in the app and, and then I don't know what's happening at the new year's. Right. So we'll we never know. We never, yeah. we never know. Right. Sky's the limit. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, thank you so much. You Definitely me. check those out. I will try to link as many things below as, as, as possible. Thank you everyone uh, for listening. And thank you, Sarah Beth, for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Have a good day.